A very good evening to everyone present here. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the Green Law Lecture on Environmental Justice and the Rule of Law, Role of the Judiciary and Judges. To get this session started, I would like to welcome Mr. Ravi Singh, Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of WWF India to give us the welcome address. Thank you and good evening. <coughs> Justice Chandrachu, Justice Gupta, I must also <coughs> welcome especially Justice Wilson and Justice McKenna. We'll talk a little bit about them very briefly right now, but uh, just to take this forward. I, uh, while welcoming all of you here, uh, this is an unusual uh, you know, day in a fashion that I'm making two inaugural or introductory lectures in a day. The first was in the morning, and the second is now. And sometimes I'm reminded, well, this is happening for me perhaps for, for a few times in my life, but it reminds me of the time I started my career as a lecturer in history in Delhi University. And to start, it, it reminds me of time that sometimes I had to take two classes at different times of the day, of the day but for on the same subject. Now, to be able to hold a class with interest for 40 minutes, when your age group of your students is older than you are, sometimes you take a lot of theatrics and everything else. But that is not what I'm going to do right now. But. <coughs> It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you. The uh, Green Law Lecture, which is in a point of going into a new phase with the partnership with OP General University, and with the uh, hope that this progression of environmental law and its uh, enactment, its uh, jurisprudence, the thought pattern behind it, and its progression in line with what our society and our, the, the, the continuous progression and transition of Indian society goes forward. I think this is something that's a great uh, thing to witness at this point of time. I'd just like to say in the morning, Dr. Swatantra Kumar mentioned that a lot of us, including myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Sejal Bora, we're talking sometimes in a language that is not easily or commonly understood by the by the normal people. I don't consider all of you to be normal, but uh, uh, I think he was right. Is that sometimes I know working with the corporate sector, working with certain universities, people, citizens of small towns and cities who have not had huge amounts of exposure to certain areas. Uh, you know, even explaining biodiversity meaning of biodiversity to, to business and industry is a challenge. Because most people think biodiversity contributions by their institutions is growing trees or protecting something. And the way we are looking at climate change and how the interaction of this with adaptation and how common people would look at it in terms of growing crops or protecting their livelihoods is something that we need to simplify our terminology to be able to implement better. <clears throat> I'm amazed by the number of people, I mean, Justices Wilson and McKenna are here. They are from the United States of America, from the state of Hawaii, very far from us. And the closest that we can get to them is a terminology which is called the Indo-Pacific, which has started growing more and more. By the way, Indo-Pacific was started as a terminology written by a Navy subaltern in India as a part of his assignment in a training institute as to how this is important and the complexities of the, it's not the Indian Ocean alone, but it's also the connection with the Pacific and what the interactions are. And so many of us talk about it right now. As far as WWF is concerned, the only thing I remember was the Indo-Pacific dolphin, which by the way is found on the off on the coast of Goa. But anyway, let that be. I'm amazed by the number of people, Justices, <coughs> Michael Wilson and Sabrina McKenna know 
In fact, I think they know more people than most of us. Everyone who is greeting them like old friends. So there is a connect. And this connect is not just personal. It's also through perhaps institutions of two great nations who are able to talk to each other with some amount of understanding that is very deep and fundamental to their constitutional values. And I'm proud to be a part of this country for that very reason. And <clears throat> I think uh, the, the, uh, every citizen has a responsibility in India to protect the environment. I would do that in my personal capacity, but I'm also trying to help others through my organization to understand that and take it forward in the best way possible. And that is the fundamental foundation of the Green Law Lecture. <clears throat> I have met uh, people from the legal profession and those who are studying the profession in different parts of India, in different times, in some difficult circumstances, and in very different uh, events and incidents and events. I think through all of them, I've not come across a single incident where that person, whether he knew what I was doing or not, or my team or whatever, always had something to care for the environment and to say that we need to protect it. And it could be a person from different walks of uh, law practice. It could be somebody in criminal law, or contractual law, or constitutional law. But this aspect was coming through very, very clearly. I'd like to take this ahead. I'd like to welcome all of you. We have two eminent justices in this room. I think we need to hear from them and to also to some of my colleagues and students to take notes so that we can take this forward in our lives and we can look back and see if we can contribute to something that they have said here today. Thank you and welcome once again. Uh, once again, a very good afternoon to all of you, rather good evening to all of you. I would like to once again extend a warm welcome to our very distinguished uh, two judges from the Supreme Court of India. Uh, both Justice Michael Wilson and Justice Sabrina have been attending the conference from the morning and um, they've become part of this initiative uh, for a very long time now. Um, I really deem it a huge privilege for us here at WW of India as well as Peter the Global University for having two of our distinguished judges from the Supreme Court of India to be present uh, amidst us on this very special occasion uh, to deliver the Green Law Lecture and to really launch uh, a Master of Laws program specifically focusing on environmental law, energy and climate change. Um, for As far as my role is concerned, I would very briefly introduce the university and the law school to you. Obi Jindal Global University was uh, created as a philanthropic initiative in the year 2009. Uh, with an ambition and aspiration to build a world-class university in India. Uh, we started off in a very modest manner with the law school with only 100 students and uh, 10 faculty members in the year 2009. We never looked back since then. In 2010, we started the business school. In 2011, the School of International Affairs. In 2012, the School of Government and Public Policy. In 2013, the School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. In 2016, the School of Journalism and Communication. In 2017, the School of Art and Architecture and also the School of Banking and Finance. We moved from, say, 10 full-time faculty members to 440 full-time faculty members. We moved from 100 students to 4,400 students, which essentially means that we maintain a 1 to 10 faculty-student ratio, which, in academic terms, is an enviable position to be in. We are also a multidisciplinary university when it comes to research, and our law school has pioneered in the context of creating an environment in which our students can cross-register courses across different schools and programs. Uh, there are a number of aspects to our law schools which are quite unique, but uh, it is suffice to say that 17% of our full-time faculty members are non-Indian nationals recruited from uh, 32 countries and regions around the world. The average age of our faculty is 37. I'm uh, very pleased to report that we just published a diversity report of the university. 50% of our students are women, 50% of our faculty are women. And so that makes our law school and our university quite unique, and not just in the Indian context, but also uh, in many parts of the world. We are a global university, and we take that responsibility very seriously. We have partnerships and collaborations with over 250 universities around the world, including the University of Hawaii. Um, we have uh, 
We built substantive partnerships in the form of 10 different collaborations, which include faculty exchanges, student exchanges, joint teaching, joint research, joint conferences, joint publications, dual degree programs, short-term study abroad programs, inward mobility immersion programs, as well as joint executive education programs. We partner with institutions with a view to providing a transformative learning opportunity for our students. In fact, one of the pioneering partnerships that we introduced was the relationship between the Supreme Court of Hawaii and the General Global Law School. A few years ago, when Justice Michael Wilson visited uh, our university, we began talking, and that led to a number of initiatives which ultimately culminated to an extraordinary opportunity for our students in which every year, five students of General Global Law School go as summer judicial clerks to the uh, University of Hawaii, but primarily to the Supreme Court of Hawaii, in which they clerk with these judges, not uh, besides the two judges who are present here. There are three more judges uh, who are also part of the Supreme Court, and they clerk with them. That experience, which has now gone through uh, a few years, and 20 students have been immensely benefited by that opportunity, has been truly inspiring. Uh, this relationship that uh, was built between the Supreme Court of Hawaii and General Global Law School has now broadened and I'm very pleased to report that uh, uh, Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Thakur, as Chief Justice of India, visited the uh, so Supreme Court of Hawaii. Uh, we've also had visits from Justice Arjun Sikri, uh, Justice uh, Satendra Kumar, and of course most recently Justice Chandrachud. And so, as uh, Mr. Singh was mentioning, uh, this relationship has gone beyond individuals. It has developed an institutional character, and a lot has happened since uh, both judiciaries and both institutions and universities have begun to interact with each other. Um, on, in relation to today's uh, conference, as well as uh, today's launch of the LLM program, I would like to say that uh, the theme of environmental law and climate change um, is probably the most important issue that universities and law schools should be concerned about. Uh, there is a sense of responsibility on the part of higher education institutions to be able to address issues that are going to have significant implications for the future. Environment is one such thing. But even more importantly, uh, legal institutions and laws have a very significant role in speaking truth to power. Public policy and law has that goal, and with that objective, we are launching today the Master of Laws program in collaboration with the WWF India. I am grateful to the leadership of uh, Mr. Ravi Singh, as well as uh, Molika, who has the uh, Environment Center for Environmental Law program here, and also my own colleague, Professor Sridhar Patnaik, and many other individuals, including our Registrar Professor Murthy, for fashioning a unique form of relationship which will ultimately provide opportunities for generations of uh, lawyers uh, to be able to specialize in a program uh, which is a Master of Laws program focusing on environmental law, energy, and climate change. Uh, we also want to mention that uh, given the relationship which the Supreme Court of Hawaii and Justice Michael Wilson and others have with the IUCN and the Global uh, Judicial Institute as a part of the IUCN, uh, we are very fortunate that many judges around the world have, will also be part of the LLM program in which they will be teaching. I'm very pleased to report that Justice Michael Wilson has agreed to teach the LLM students uh, in this program. Uh, so have been other individuals who are both present uh, in this room today. Uh, lastly, I want to recognize the distinguished presence of uh, many individuals who are here. I'll name a few. Uh, I can't help but to recognize uh, Professor Armin Rosenkrantz. All of us uh, grew up in India as law students studying Armin's uh, uh, book on environmental law. And uh, Armin has moved from Stanford to Sonipat and teaches at General Global Law School. And I'm very grateful to him for that. Uh, I also want to recognize the presence of my dear friend and classmates, uh, Sridhar uh, as well as Sudhir Mishra, both of them lawyers in, in, in uh, Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court for taking the time out to be present on this occasion. I want to recognize the presence of Mr. R. Venkatramani, Senior Counsel of the Supreme Court of India, uh, and many other lawyers who are present here, law students and people who care about the environment uh, to be part of this conversation and this launch. I lastly want to say that uh, uh, it is uh, extremely generous on the part of both uh, Justice uh, Chandrachud and Justice Mishra to take out time from a very busy sch schedule on the middle of the week when they have so much to do both in the day and then to prepare for tomorrow. Uh, it, has ref it reflects their deep commitment to environment 
and also institution building and its potential for building a community of scholars and students and thinkers who deeply care about the environment. Uh, I would like to particularly thank uh, Justice Chandrachud for being a great source of inspiration for me personally, for all the work that he does, but more importantly for his uh, you know, relentless support to institutional causes that has a transformative impact. And that's what uh, Justice Sandhachud has stood uh, all through his life, and I'm very grateful to him for supporting the cause of building this relationship with the Supreme Court of Hawaii, as well as the University of Hawaii Law School. Uh, I want to end by saying that we have also made a major announcement today in relation to providing scholarships uh, uh, for the students uh, who intend to pursue this program, and that's a separate announcement we made. But the idea is that we would like to make this program as accessible to people who may not be able to afford uh, education. And hence, the goal is to be able to attract individuals who are deeply committed to the study of environmental law and through legal institutions contribute towards mitigating the challenges posed by climate change. Uh, with those words, I would like to once again thank all of you for your presence, for your participation. I know many of you have stayed through the entire day, uh, starting from the inaugural session and the uh, thematic sessions. And I'm grateful to all of you for uh, playing an active role in today's conference and as well as the Green Law Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I request Professor Patnayan to give us an introduction to this seminar. Good evening, everyone. Uh, in particular, we are so pleased that uh, we are in the presence of Justice uh, Deepak Gupta, Justice Chandrachu, and Justice uh, Sabrina McKenna, and Justice Michael Wilson, in addition to other you know, jurists, legal luminaries, professors, students, again, uh, about whom I always keep saying that they are the change agents. Well, it's indeed a particular privilege to all of us uh, here at OP Jindal Global University and also the WWF India that we are in a position to delightfully launch the Law Masters program or the LLM program in environmental law, energy and climate change. And also, it's personally uh, momentous occasion to me uh, because I happen to be the director of the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies at the Jindal Global Law School of the OP Jindal Global University. And uh, we have always envisioned to have graduate programs in law uh, which uh, provide a very unique and an enriching experience to all those students coming to read LLM at our university. And if I may just take the liberty of saying this, uh, we got many things right in terms of our higher education and also particularly legal education. But in legal education, uh, there has been so much focus on undergraduate legal education, but somewhere uh, in this journey, uh, there uh, ought to be more uh, uh, attention given to or focus on postgraduate legal education. And we at Jindal, uh, we take our uh, higher education objective seriously. So we have decided to sort of have an autonomous or a dedicated graduate center uh, that offers postgraduate programs in law and PhD programs in law. And that incidentally coincided with uh, the University Grants Commission one year regulations on uh, LLM programs in law in India, uh, which essentially stated that all law universities and law schools and even other universities uh, which intend to run master's programs in law uh, of one year duration they need to uh, set up a center for postgraduate legal studies, which uh, will have uh, dedicated faculty members and other research associates and support staff and admin staff, so that it is to ensure that uh, the policies are not going to overlap uh, as far as the undergraduate legal education and the postgraduate legal education is concerned. But I must make a very important point over here. This uh, UGC uh, one-year regulations Although uh, they were promulgated uh, way back in January 2013, but the vision of uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajkumar, uh, it sort of preceded that, because way back in 2012 at the OP Jindal Global University, he set up a committee called the Committee on Postgraduate Legal Studies and Research, which incidentally I was made the uh, chairperson of that particular committee, to see in what manner we can get things right as far as LLM is concerned, and in what manner we can also have 
a roadmap to start a PhD program in law. And that's when we did some work and then we set up the uh, entire uh, uh, sort of, we brought in all the ideas together and set up a framework to have uh, one year LLM programs uh, at the OP Jinder Global University, which will essentially give a very definitive experience to students. So we went ahead and we launched our LLM programs with specializations mostly in private law areas and they are in the fields of corporate and financial law and policy and also uh, areas in relation to international trade and investment law which has a lot of interface with public law and even public international law and then intellectual property rights and technology law and taxation law and off late we added to our basket of courses the general legal studies and while we have done this we were also very mindful of the fact that students are not going to read these subjects in isolation from other subjects. And at Jindal, we have provided that particular academic freedom to students, albeit with some element of guidance and even mentorship, so that they end up choosing some of the right kind of foundational subjects, because as they envisage and going on a career path, it's not going to be very clear whether they are going to work in a particular area, but as many of the uh, law professors and honorable judges and everyone would agree with me, if in case our foundations of law and jurisprudence is going to be correct, and then we can deal with any other area of law. And this, in fact, happens to be one of our key objectives while even preparing the learning outcomes for the LLM programs. And also, one of our key objectives, even while preparing the attributes or the characteristics that a prospective or even an incumbent LLM student ought to have a Jindal. And these attributes are also in tune or in coherence uh, with the graduate attributes of the OP Jindal Global University, wherein we have a lot of focus on students uh, developing certain necessary transferable skills that they can take back to uh, whatever work they intend to take up in the future, and also uh, sort of critical abilities, critical thinking, and even self-reflection, and even self-learning, which is very important. And in a way to say, we wanted to just fill those gaps wherein students are going to make more meaningful contributions to the paths that they are going to choose. And also, we are very lucky in this particular journey called setting up uh, the master's program uh, in law and even the PhD in law, that we uh, could have uh, a postgraduate advisory board comprising of some of the top professors uh, coming from uh, Europe, uh, United States, Singapore, and even top uh, law officers like the principal legal councils representing the WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization, the World Trade Organization, and including the Permanent Court of Arbitration at the Hague. And that's what helped us a lot because even we could take some advice guidance from them in terms of devising our pedagogy, pedagogy and even our methodology and the manner in which we ought to approach so that ours can become one of the uh, I will not use the word, but I use this particular word with all consciousness. Best programs in the country and also in the region and people can look up to so that we can fill those gaps. But as you all would agree with me, innovation is the key. And we wanted to innovate ourselves in terms of the programs we start because we also do have a responsibility as law professors, law teachers, researchers and mentors. And in particular as a university, to sort of understand what the problems are in the society that we are besieged with and in what manner we can also build and develop uh, capacity that can sort of contribute to the social challenges or any other kind of challenges that we have. So we traversed in this particular direction of starting a program on environmental law, energy and climate change and our idea is to also sort of see because as we have heard uh, during the day the number of challenges and solutions proposed and what methods we need to apply to sort of address these challenges and also we discussed uh, during the inaugural session uh, about the importance that everyone would agree and understand that we need to care for our environment but what we need to do and one of the one of the ways to do it as even just as Michael Wilson had mentioned in the address this morning have a capacity building program that too in a formal manner and that's going to contribute to the rule of law. So that's the idea with which uh, we uh, embarked upon uh, initiating this program and again I must uh, confess and uh, I must share in all candidness 
the entire uh, credit goes to uh, the leadership of uh, Professor Rajkumar uh, and uh, the uh, uh, idea uh, emerged over here uh, in the precincts of the WWF, uh, I think way back in 20, 2016, October, I believe, when uh, WWF was kind enough to host a delegation from the United Nations and the uh, legal officials of uh, various UN bodies were visiting us and then we came here for a visit because many of them are working in the field of environment and climate change so we thought that probably there could be an interactive session that could be arranged over here and that's when uh, he foresaw a situation wherein we can start this. So a lot of work happened, discussions, ideas, brainstorming, any number of drafts and joining the dots together and here we are this evening. Uh, proudly and gladly launching this program. And this program we are particularly aiming at those who are working uh, or even fresh graduates and those who are working in uh, intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, the government, and even those who are into litigation with a focus on environmental law and even for everyone having some kind of an interface to deal with matters in relation to environment, energy, land tenure, forestation, etc., so on and so forth, because these days there is both a vertical and even a horizontal interaction with these areas, and this would be essentially useful to all of them, and we intend to make a contribution in this particular direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Diving into the much-awaited Green Law Lecture on Environmental Justice and the Rule of Law, Role of the Judiciary and Judges, I now invite Honorable Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachur, Judge, Supreme Court of India, to address us. Thank you very much. Very good evening to all of you. Very distinguished colleagues uh, in the dais and in the audience. Very dear friend, uh, Justice Mike Wilson. This is Sabina McKenna. Kuma spent an extended part of the last summer in Hawaii. Uh, my very distinguished colleague, Justice Deepak Gupta, Mr. Ravi Singh, uh, of course, Professor Raj Kumar, and uh, all of you in the audience, all friends of the environment. It is indeed a very signal honor for me to be invited to speak at the WWF Green Law Lecture on environmental justice and the rule of law. And though the topic has something to do with the role of the judiciary and judges, let me begin by telling you that I'm also going to talk about the limitations of a judge-centric approach to the environment. Uh, but first and foremost, let me thank the organizers, particularly Jindal Global Law School, my good friend, Professor Rajkumar, and WWF for putting this timely initiative forward at such a crucial time. On my way to the venue, I checked the air quality index. The overall particulate matter, PM 2.5, was 154, which falls in the unhealthy category. And it got me thinking about what our bodies are subjected to because of the toxic air that we breathe every day of our lives. Just a few days ago, the city of Gurugram, uh, for Mike and Sabrina, a financial and technological hub located just 30 kilometers southwest of New Delhi, was ranked as one of the most polluted cities in the world. At the same time, the sale of air purifiers and face masks across the capital increased manifold. This perhaps shows us the fallacy in our thinking and highlights our inability to tackle the root cause of air pollution. Such band-aid measures are classic examples of our failure to address the problem of environmental pollution or attain environmental justice. But perhaps what strikes me most as a judge is that the haves who can afford such measures to mitigate the impact of air pollution <coughs> move on with their lives by installing air purifiers in almost every possible living space. Whereas those do, do not have that luxury, the poor, the impoverished, and the marginalized 
continue to suffer by breathing toxic air. While persons with fewer resources are always not equally responsible for polluting the environment, they often bear the largest brunt of ecological damage. It is certain that going forward, the Earth's air will not just be warmer, it is likely that it will also be dirtier, more oppressive and more sickening. Breathing this polluted air has a deleterious and often irreversible effect on human health. It is estimated that one out of every eight deaths in India is due to air pollution and 77% of Indians are exposed to particulate matter PM 2.5 greater than 40 micrograms per cubic meter, which is four times the WHO recommended criteria for ambient air quality. The situation in the capital city, New Delhi, is equally bad and reminds me of the horrid images of the Chinese air poor calypse, if I may call that so, of 2013 that covered Beijing with a thick smog. I wonder whether New Delhi is competing with Beijing on this aspect as well. Our inaction in tackling the worsening air pollution levels must remind us of the words of the 16-year-old Greta Thunberg of Sweden, who has been missing school every Friday and instead protesting outside the Swedish parliament. By holding a banner saying school strike for climate, she demanded her country to take more effective measures against climate change. Her act of civil disobedience sparked similar movements across the world, including New Delhi. Speaking at a TED talk on immediate action for climate change, which I really enjoyed watching, she said, everyone keeps saying that climate change is an existential threat and the most important issue of all and yet they just carry on like before. No one talks about it. No one is acting as if we were in a crisis. My children and grandchildren will maybe ask me about you, the people who were around back in 2018. Maybe they will ask why you did not do anything while still there was time to act. We need to change and it has to start today. So the age of climate panic is here. Devastating and irreparable impacts of human activities on the environment are clearly visible. Bangladesh, which is one of the world's lowest lying countries and amongst the most vulnerable to climate change, has predicted that 17% of the country will be submerged underwater by 2050, displacing tens of millions of people. The Himalayas are expected to lose two-thirds of their glaciers by 2100, causing radical disruptions to food and water supplies and mass population displacement. I've been traveling extensively in Ladakh year after year, and every year that I've been to Ladakh, on my way from Leh to Kargil and then to Zanskar, you see the denudation of the glaciers so clearly. According to a study, Chennai City's fragile water table is under threat of saline seawater intrusion due to anticipated increase in sea levels of over the next few decades as a result of climate change. It is estimated that at the given rate of increase in sea levels, the water table would witness an incursion of seawater to the extent of 2 to 3 millimeters every year and an area of 1.5 square kilometers of land along the coastline in Thiruvannamayur and Palavakam would be lost by 2100. Human-driven climate change has claimed its first extinction of a mammal, a small rodent called the Bramble K mosaic tailed rat in Australia. Due to rising sea levels coupled with worsening storms that wiped out its food supplies. The impact of human activities is also visible in the oceans. All of us know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch 79,000 tons of plastic debris, three times the size of France, floating freely in the Pacific Ocean, posing a risk to marine animals. The horrid images of a young whale carcass washed up in the Philippines, which had died out of dehydration and starvation 
after consuming 40 kilograms of plastic, reminds us of the crisis that marine debris causes and the impact of harmful human activities on the wildlife and the environment. With the increase in emission of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere and rapid deforestation, there are evident signs of increased natural disasters and related climate change occurrences that are taking a toll on humanity. In 2017, South Asia flooding due to the monsoon rains in India, Nepal and Bangladesh affected more than 41 million people, claimed over 1,200 lives and damaged 950,000 houses. Just a few days ago, the wrath and devastation caused by the cyclone Idai in Mozambique has affected more than 1.7 million people and destroyed 90% of Bira, the fourth largest city of Mozambique. Similarly, in 2017, Hurricane Maria, the strongest hurricane to hit Puerto Rico in nearly a century, claimed nearly 3,000 lives and displaced many more. Failure to mitigate the increasing emissions has made the planet biologically impoverished and left millions of people without fresh groundwater, agricultural produce, employment, and expose them to disease. All these disasters have two things in common, and that's the message for all of us. First, the poor were the worst affected due to their inability to foresee or preempt climate risks. And second, it recognizes the concept of climate refugees that are fleeing drought, floods, extreme heat, and other climate-driven disasters all across the world. According to the 2018 report of Lancet Countdown, climate change is the sole contributing factor for thousands of people deciding to migrate and is a powerful contributing factor for many more migration decisions worldwide. Disasters have no boundaries and with increase in frequency and severity of climate-related disasters, it is imperative for countries to make disaster management as an urgent priority. Irreversible changes in our ecosystem and the visible impact of climate change across the globe urge all countries to address the problem of climate change as a collective action problem. As we know, in 2015, world leaders adopted the Sustainable Development Goals as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In line with the international efforts to reduce carbon emissions, countries at the meeting for the Paris Agreement agreed to set a goal to keep global temperature from rising above 2 degrees Celsius, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, above pre-industrial levels. The Conference of Parties, COP24, at Katowice in Poland, set out a uniform set of standards for measuring and tracking country-wise emissions. The Doomsday, the Doomsday Report of the, United System of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that described the climate effects at 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of warming emphasized on the need for a 45% fall in CO2 emissions from 2010 levels by 2030 in order to reach the goal of making human-caused emissions of CO2 net zero around 2050. According to the recent Global Energy and CO2 Status Report of the International Energy Association that was released just yesterday, global energy-related carbon emissions had hit a record high in 2018 with United States China and India accounting for 75% of the increase, indicating a rollback to their commitments under the Paris Agreement. The extraordinary increase was largely due to heating and cooling needs of nations that experienced extreme temperatures. For a developing nation like India, to my mind, the biggest challenge is to ensure energy security through sustainable means, develop infrastructure, enhance industrial production, but yet reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The worsening environmental situation in our country does call for immediate action. Between 1901 and 2007, 
India's mean temperature increased by more than 0.5 degrees Celsius. It is predicted that while the world is bracing for an increase of around 2 degrees Celsius over the 21st century, northern, central and western India may witness a further increase averaging 2.2 to 5.5 degrees by the end of the 21st century. Under the Paris Agreement, India has made three major commitments. First, greenhouse gas emissions intensity of its GDP must be reduced by 33 to 35% below 2005 levels by 2030. Second, 40% of India's power capacity would be based on non-fossil fuel sources. And third, that India must create an additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of CO2 equivalent through additional forest and tree cover by 2030. According to the second biennial update report to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in December 2018, India was, surprisingly to my mind, on track to meet its Copenhagen commitment of reduction in emissions intensity of GDP by 20 to 25 percent by 2020 with reference to the 2005 level. India, at least in official documentation, remains on track to overachieve its 2 degrees Celsius compatible targets under the Paris Agreement and was likely to achieve both its 40% non-fossil target and its emissions intensity target. Is that really going to be true in reality? However, despite its effort to meet its targets under the international treaties, India faces many climate risks due to increase in population coupled with a widening social and economic divide. India today is experiencing the worst water crisis in its history and currently 600 million Indians are facing high to extreme high water stress and about 200,000 people are dying each year from inadequate access to safe water. According to the World Bank's report, climate change could cost India 2.8% of the GDP by 2050. The need of the hour then is to undertake initiatives towards diversification of energy sources, adopting energy efficient technologies, modification of industrial processes, and carrying out energy conservation measures that will help in adapting and mitigating climate risks. The world population is projected to reach 9.8 billion in 2050 and 11.2 billion in 2100. And this is going to have a bearing on the very existence of the human race. The disruption in ecological stability due to the pressure of increasing population, rapid urbanization, and large-scale exploitation of environment resources has brought sharp focus on the need for sustainable development. Sustainable development has to be carried out in a manner where development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future to meet their own needs. Our ability to sustain development will hinge on two converging threats to humanity. First, the rising inequality between and within nations. And second, the complexity of the risks from environmental change as we continue to exploit the Earth's natural resources. It is critical for us to understand that challenges posed by environmental pollution are interrelated with social problems and the threat of climate change poses a serious challenge to life, to liberty and to civilization. The role of environmental justice must therefore necessarily be understood in that context. The causes for climate catastrophe are more and more human and the impact is determined by social factors like economic disparity, gender-based inequality, access to information and the ability of the marginalized to make their voices heard in our political systems. Everyone is impacted by climate change in one way or the other, irrespective of race, religion, socio-economic background, and national boundaries. And it's something worth remembering in a season of electoral politics. However, it is the poor whose lives and livelihoods are most seriously impacted 
as we continue to exploit natural resources at the cost of the environment. Environmental degradation generates further poverty, as it has in India, by the exhaustion of natural resources and creates prejudice to the exercise of basic rights by the affected communities. Poor and vulnerable communities who lack the resources to adapt to climate change are the real victims of various forms of environmental injustice. Their inability to fight and reverse the trends of climate change keeps them mired in a state of exclusion. Vulnerabilities are exposed in specific ways based on gender, age, ethnicity, livelihood, and such other factors. The unsustainable use of resources and ecosystem services can create risks for securing equity and justice for future generations. Hence, the concept of environmental justice has arisen in this particular context. It is a mechanism for accountability, for the protection of rights, and the prevention of disproportionate impacts of growth on the poor and vulnerable in society from rising pollution and degradation of ecosystem services and from inequitable access to and benefits from the use of natural assets and extractive resources. Contemporary academic framings of environmental justice tend to use a tripartite typology of concerns. The first is distribution. Who enjoys the rights to material benefits and who bears the costs and responsibilities? The second is recognition, respecting identities and cultural differences. And the third is procedure, decision making. Without the recognition of rights of marginalized communities, there can be no distribution of common resources unless a proper procedure accommodating equity and fairness is adopted. Civil society and grassroots community movements have promoted environmental justice. And that's a sobering reflection of the work that judges do. Their primary focus has been to work closely with the affected communities, provided them with paralegal support mechanisms, act as a channel for constant communication between the relevant stakeholders, enhance their legal knowledge, redress social injustice, maintain ecological damage, and monitor development projects that directly or indirectly affect these communities. The normative approach to environmental rights and access to justice includes incorporating a right to a healthy and clean environment under the ambit of the Constitution and legislation. That is, in a sense, what Principle 1 of the 1972 Declaration of the Stockholm or the Stockholm Declaration speaks about, namely of a fundamental right to freedom equality and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. We have ample constitutional frameworks for giving effect to these rights as judges, whether it's the right to life and personal liberty under 21, Article 21, or whether it's a fundamental duty under 51A, or whether it's Article 48 of the Directive Principles of State Policy. It is in this context that I would like to, re to discuss with you the, the role of the rule of law, the judiciary, and of the judges in ensuring access to justice and the protection of environmental rights. Legal disputes concerning the environment paved the way for the evolution of jurisprudence on environmental matters. The rule of law in environmental governance is seen as an aid in recognizing of environmental injustices faced by vulnerable groups such as indigenous tribes, women, and livelihood reliant communities. It seeks to empower them, recognizing ecosystem services as public goods, enhancing accountability in decision making, and maintaining the balance between ecological well being and development across the socio economic divide. Ecological sustainability cannot exist without the rule of law. Courts in India primarily discharge two functions in relation to environmental adjudication. First, judges exercise formal judicial control, that is, of ensuring that formal due process is followed by carrying out due diligence and reviewing environmental licenses, environmental impact assessments, and, and ensuring compliance with all statutory regulations in carrying out development projects. 
But there is a second function of judges as well, which is that they undertake substantive environmental judicial control over development projects, <coughs> where the judge within the legal framework is expected to internalize environmental costs and weigh the benefits of a development project against the loss caused to the environment. But there is a third role which I want to tell you about, and that is the third and most important role, perhaps far more important than just the adjudicatory role that judges perform. And the third role is the dialogical role which courts play in promoting a sense of dialogue over the environment. And it is this dialogical role of the courts which promotes, in a sense, a wider compliance to at least soft rule of law norms in the area of environmental governance. In our country, marginalized communities have turned to courts and to the rule of law to address growing environmental injustice. In order to ensure that citizens have access to due process of law, in relation to economic decisions concerning the environment, a comprehensive set of policy measures, EIAs, consents from panchayats, clearances, have been put into place to strike a balance between economic development and ensuring environmental justice. Oversight through the EIAs is sometimes overseen by the courts in ensuring that the impact of construction activities on the local communities is accurately assessed and their concerns are effectively heard through methods of public hearing. A comprehensive network of the Apex Court, the state judiciaries, and the National Green Tribunal, with its regional benches, has allowed for the creation of the principles of Indian environmental law in consonance with globally recognized environmental standards. Additionally, the work of law students, and that's where the LLM program is of great significance, Lawyers, also who act as a micus curiae, expert committees and judges, Suomoto, in contributing to the cause of evolving jurisprudence for ensuring environmental justice must be recognized and commended. Legal innovation has allowed courts to assume the role of a protector of the environment and of ensuring sustainable development. That has partly been achieved by the relaxation of the rule of locus standi, which we have seen over the last three decades. The Supreme Court has categorically declared that issues of the environment must and shall receive the highest attention of this court. We have been at the forefront in developing principles such as the polluter pays, the precautionary principle, sustainable development, public trust doctrine, and intergenerational equity, many of which have now been statutorily recognized by the National Green Tribunal Act of 2010. So this was really clearly an area of law where the courts really being the forerunners to statutory change rather than the other way around. Similarly, the public trust doctrine has allowed for public scrutiny of ineffective management of environmental resources by governmental agencies. It further allows for the evolution of legal jurisprudence with respect to environmental matters and provides an insight into current practices, thinking and strategies among legal professionals, experts in the judiciary. Often, Indian courts have been tasked with the difficult object of providing quick action or response in order to prevent irreversible harm to the environment. But let us also remember that environmental courts across jurisdictions are, providing to be, are proving to be critical to the application of the rule of law to en ensure environmental justice. Judges across the world have taken a proactive stance in recognizing the concept of climate change under the constitutional and legislative frameworks by drawing a link between access to the judiciary in environmental matters with human rights law. Recently, in 2019, Chief Justice Preston of the Land Environment Court in New South Wales delivered a landmark decision in the case of the Gloucester Resources Limited versus Minister of Planning, where he confirmed the decision to refuse permission for a new open-cut coal mine on the ground that the proposed mine's estimated contribution to greenhouse emissions and the social impacts of the coal mine could not be mitigated. And I'd love for you to just listen to a small quote from Chief Justice Preston's judgment because I deeply respect him as well. And he says, there is also inequity in the distribution between current and future generations. The economic and social benefits of the project will last only for the life of the project 
less than two decades, but the environmental, social, and economic burdens of the project will endure not only for the life of the project, for, but some will continue for long after. The social impacts on culture and community, especially for the Aboriginal people whose country has been mined, will persist. The project will emit greenhouse gases and contribute to climate change, the consequences of which will burden future generations. In the Netherlands, 900 Dutch citizens, along with Urgenda Foundation, an organization focused on creating a sustainable society, sued the Dutch government for not taking sufficient steps in line with the country's international treaty obligations to prevent global climate change. In 2015, the District Court of The Hague allowed the claim of the plaintiffs and ruled that the Dutch government must cut its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 25% by the end of 2020 compared to 1990 levels and directed the government to take immediate action on climate change. And the Dutch court held, due to the severity of the consequences of climate change and the great risk of hazardous climate change occurring without mitigating measures, the court concludes that the state has a duty of care to take mitigation measures. It follows that a sufficient causal link can be assumed to exist between the Dutch greenhouse gas emissions, global climate change, and the effects now and in the future on the Dutch living climate. The fact that the current Dutch greenhouse gas emissions are limited on a global scale does not alter the fact that these emissions contribute to climate change. In October 2018, the Dutch Court of Appeal upheld the 2015 decision. According to Judge Stan de Sonneville, Netherlands has a duty of care under the European Convention on Human Rights. He held that climate change is a grave danger any postponement of emissions reductions exacerbates the risks of climate change. The Dutch government cannot hide behind other countries' emissions. It has an independent duty to reduce emissions from its own territory. According to the Climate Change Center at Columbia Law School, there are approximately 272 climate change lawsuits filed against the governments of various countries, excluding the United States. The Dutch case has changed the course of climate litigation across the world and represents a new front on climate action. An environmental NGO filed a first ever climate case against the Irish government on the ground that the existing policies were not enough to reduce Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions and is in violation of Ireland's Climate Act, the Irish Constitution and human rights obligations. In March of 2019, the French government was sued by environmental groups, including Greenpeace and Oxfam, for insufficient policy actions to tackle climate change under the Paris Agreement. Similarly, in the United States, Judge Ann Eichen of the US District Court of Oregon found that future generations have a fundamental right under the US Constitution to a climate change system capable of human life and allowed a suit filed by 21 young individuals against government agencies for failing to fulfill their obligations under the public trust doctrine when they allowed fuel production, consumption, and combustion at, at dangerous levels. In 2018, the Commission of Human Rights in the Philippines agreed to hold a public hearing probing the alleged responsibility of major fossil fuel companies in precipitating climate change and how it impact the human rights of its citizens. In 2018, the Supreme Court of Justice of Colombia allowed a claim filed by 25 young plaintiffs living in the Amazon who were worst affected by climate change. The court found the Colombian authorities in violation of the intergenerational agreement to reduce deforestation and the emission of greenhouse gases under the Paris Agreement. The bench recognized the need to protect the Amazon River ecosystem and in a powerful judgment said thus, Without a healthy environment, they said, the subjects of law and living beings in general will not be able to survive, let alone safeguard those rights for our children or for future generations. In order to protect the vital ecosystem for the global future, just as the Constitutional Court declared the Atrato River, the Colombian Amazon region is recognized as an entity, a subject of rights. The conservation of the Amazon 
is a national and global obligation dealing with the main environmental axis existing on the planet by which reason it has been catalogued as the lung of the world. A recent closer home, a recent judgment by the Bangladesh High Court declared the Tula River as a living entity and emphasized on the need for preventing degradation due to encroachment, misuse, illegal and unplanned settlements by criminal gangs, politicians, and even bureaucrats. Doesn't that sound familiar to us? Well, a case was brought against the Pakistani government before the Lahore, before the Lahore High Court's Green Bench for failing to develop the required resilience to climate change as required under the government's own framework. Judge Syed Mansur Ali Shah, who is now a very distinguished judge of the Supreme Court of Pakistan, ordered the establishment of a National Climate Change Commission with a clear remit to ensure effective implementation. According to Mansur, Justice Shah, for Pakistan, he says, climate change is no longer a distant threat. We are already feeling and experiencing its impacts across the country and the region. The country experienced devastating floods during the last three years. These changes come with far-reaching consequence and real economic costs. Thus, courts across jurisdictions have started recognizing the imminent risks of climate change and have linked the right to life with the protection and conservation of environmental resources. Never before, to my mind, has the role of judges been so relevant in shaping the path towards ensuring environmental justice. At this point, I would like to quote the words of Justice Antonio Herman Benjamin, an India friend, a judge of the National High Court of Brazil in an urban, in an urban planning case. And Justice Antonio said, although courts do not design or build or administer cities, that does not mean that they cannot do anything for them. No judge no matter how great her interest in, knowledge of, or ability in the art of urban planning, architecture, and landscape, will take upon herself anything beyond the simple role of engineering the legal discourse. And as we know, cities will not rise or evolve with words alone. But words spoken by judges can indeed encourage destruction or legitimize conservation endorse speculation or guarantee urban environmental quality, consolidate the errors of the past, repeat them in the present, or enable a sustainable future. So that really embodies for us a philosophy for judges can either be cynical of the limits of our own capacity or optimistic of the scope for human action in the future. While adjudicating cases that involve the environmental impact of human activities, judges must bear in mind the ramifications of a human activity in question that may move us towards a world with increased climate risk and accordingly balance out the needs of development with the protection of the environment. In ensuring fairness and delivering justice, the judiciary has to ensure that in the early stages of decision making, all affected parties are able to express their opinion in a transparent manner. And I think this expression of opinion by affected communities is the heart of the rule of law and environmental governance. Judges must also ensure that the outcome of the adjudicatory process is intelligible to ordinary citizens, especially the marginalized, when questions of law involve high levels of scientific and technical complexity. As these examples demonstrate, at the heart of environmental cases before the courts is the vexed question of balancing development with the protection of the environment. Though the development of infrastructure is an important facet of progress, under an environmental rule of law, the protection of the environment is an inherent facet of that development. It is only when we recognize that, that the agenda of sustainable development would be met. In the last part of my presentation this evening, let me really take a slightly different theme. We've been talking about the role of judges when they decide cases. But judges have a different role. We are also people who preside over our own institutions. So the role of the judiciary is not just limited to an institution for dispensing justice. 
judges and the judiciary can also play an important role in assisting a shift to a sustainable society. I often reflect on how, as judges, we can contribute to reducing the carbon footprint. With increase in education and legal awareness, citizens are becoming more and more aware of their rights and enforcing them in courts. According to the National Crime Records Bureau report, in 2016, there were a total of 20 lakh 94,996, that is uh, 2,094,996 charge sheets submitted by the police in relation to cognizable offenses under the Indian Penal Code. This is going to add up to the existing figure of more than 30 million cases which are pending in Indian courts. In order to meet the requirements of the pending cases, more court complexes with adequate facilities will have to be provided. At this juncture, I ask, what is the environmental cost of litigation in India? We are aware that the litigation process requires excessive documentation and the use of paper. With all due respects to the learned seniors who are present here, that's how you frighten the litigants. <laughs> According to studies, providing 100,000 A4 size sheets, ATGSM, of paper from new sources requires about eight trees and almost 2,000 kilowatts of energy. As judges and lawyers, we need to be more environmentally sensitive and ensure that the printing of paper is only done whenever it is necessary. There should be a national level policy for handing and disposing files and documents for cases that have been disposed of. Courts should be located centrally so that they are easily accessible and litigants do not have to travel long distances, adding up to environmental costs. And the critical area is for the National Green Tribunal to really fan out to different parts of the country and not expect citizens to come to large metropolitan cities in aid of justice. In the pursuit of making the Indian judiciary more environmentally conscious, courts across India have adopted technology to make the judicial process more environment friendly and organized. The websites maintained by the courts are used as platforms to upload cause lists daily orders and judgments. Our judiciary has incorporated information and communication technology under the auspices of the e-courts integrated mission mode project. This has been a part of the national e-governance plan, which has been implemented in all high courts and the district courts in India. The e-committee of the Supreme Court of India, of which I am a part, and the Department of Justice of the Government of India, through a management of the e-courts project, ensured efficiency in the judicial process across 21,000 courts in the district judiciary in India. In an effort to speed up the judicial process, video conferencing facilities connecting courts and jails have been established in 488 courts and 342 jails across India that facilitate trial proceedings without physically transporting the accused to the court. Various platforms for service delivery, such as automated emails, e-payment, and e-filing, have reduced the consumption of paper and assisted in reducing the carbon footprint. However, at present, there are no uniform standards for the construction of court complexes. In an effort to reduce the carbon footprint of existing and future court complexes, a special focus should be laid on installation of solar panels, rainwater harvesting mechanisms, and energy efficient electricity fittings. It is imperative that while discharging our public duties as judges, we continue to remain environmentally conscious. Although government has introduced policies to ensure minimizing the impact of the development on environment, these steps towards sustainability are insufficient unless each one of us does our bit in minimizing individual carbon footprints. Social justice cannot be achieved without an equitable sharing of the costs and benefits of environmental protection. The road to building a sustainable future begins with our actions at home and in our professional workplaces. In the words of Vaclav Havel, the first president of the Czech Republic, the only option is a change in the sphere of the spirit, in the sphere of human conscience. It is not enough to invent new machines, new regulations, or new institutions. Only by making such a fundamental shift will we be able to create new models of behavior and a new set of values for the planet. 
while the government and industries have the responsibility of doing more in curtailing climate change, our lifestyle and the way we choose to live also has a significant potential of reducing carbon footprint and to enable protection of the environment. In that sense, Gandhi was critical of modern civilization, which led to the degradation of environment, and once said that the distinguishing characteristic aspect of modern civilization is an indefinite multiplicity of wants. It is estimated that it takes about 7,500 liters of water to make a single pair of jeans, equivalent to the amount of water the average person drinks over a period of <coughs> seven years. And the fashion industry uses approximately 93 billion cubic meters of water annually. That is enough to meet the needs of five million people. In the larger scheme of things, small decisions and changes of habits in relation to what we eat, what we wear, how we travel, and how we work can go a long way in assisting our transiting into a sustainable society. So it is, time to, it is time that we see ourselves as ecological citizens who must give priority to environmental considerations. In the words of Wallace Wells, the author of The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, we build our view of the universe outward from our own experience. A reflective tendency that surely shapes our ability to comprehend genuinely existential threats to the species. We have a tendency to wait for others to act rather than acting ourselves. A preference for the present situation, a disinclination to change things, and an excess of confidence that we can change things easily should we need to, no matter the scale. We can't see anything but through cataracts of self deception. A positive step in the direction of living a sustainable <coughs> lifestyle starts from small initiatives, such as turning off lights and electronic products when not in use, turning off the car engines at red lights, segregating waste at home, using high-rated efficiency bulbs, installing solar panels at home, carpooling, increasing the green cover, and saving water. There used to be a prevailing idiom about how you recognized a judge in a small town in Maharashtra where I was born. And that prevailing idiom was, how do you recognize a judge? Well, you recognize a judge, that's the person who is suited, well-groomed, in black leather shoes, <coughs> riding a bicycle to work. There is a message in this for judges of all jurisdictions, including the Supreme Court. The cycle is good for the climate. It is good for a leveling culture, but above all, good for our sedentary bellies. One can also draw inspiration from the recent Padma Shri Award winner, a 106-year-old woman, commonly referred to as the mother of trees, who planted nearly 8,000 trees in 80 years in Karnataka. One cannot ignore that we are a civilization in crisis, and nothing short of an evolution in consciousness will create the transformation we must undergo. Young climate change leaders are putting their best foot forward in minimizing the impact of human activities on the environment. In an effort to clean up the 1.8 trillion pieces of trash floating in the Great Pacific garbage patch, an 18-year-old Dutch inventor, Boyan Slat, founded a non-profit entity called Oceans Cleanup. With the aid of technology, a floating U-shaped boom system has been developed that drifts along the ocean currents, collecting trash that is later recycled. And then you have our own young lawyer from Mumbai who has cleaned up the beaches of Varsova, from Varsova to Juhu to Dadar. In a world of technology, People have also taken to social media to highlight the impact of climate change. The recent social media trend called the hashtag 10 year challenge is a particularly interesting conversation starter, compelling people to reflect on the impact of climate change. Various social media posts that showed pictorial representations of the depletion of glaciers, the loss of forest cover, increase in pollution, 
changes in landscape and other impacts of global warming over the past 10 years are uploaded with the tagline, the only 10 year challenge we should care about. The posts have been shared multiple times and shocked the conscience of people. So in conclusion, let me say that while governments work on shaping policies that promote sustainable development, one needs to introspect on one's own actions and address the problem of ensuring environmental justice. It is only when we consider climate change as a collective action problem that we can ensure environmental justice. <coughs> After all, every individual is affected by climate change in one way or the other. Our actions and decisions today are critical in ensuring a safe and sustainable planet for the existing and future generations. I do hope that the young will pave the path for a better future. I urge the millennials to embrace fresh and creative ideas to protect their future from an environmental crisis without impeding on our requirements for the day. In the words of Amartya Sen, we as humans are not only patients whose needs demand attention, but also agents whose freedom to decide what to value and how to pursue it can extend far beyond the fulfillment of our needs. As I conclude then, we must aim at development without destruction and progress even more than before to ensure livelihoods, economic prosperity, and for restoring harmony with the natural world. I'm really thankful to you for your very patient attention. for highlighting the crucial role of judiciary and our society in promoting environmental justice. I now invite Honorable Mr. Justice Deepak Gupta, Judge, Supreme Court of India, to give us his presidential address. Well, thank you and a very good evening to all of you. My esteemed brother, Mr. Dharanjay Chandrasho, who has delivered a very erudite and a learned lecture, the first lecture of this series. Uh, then Judge Wilson, Judge McKenna from Hawaii, both of you. Mr. Ravi Singh, Secretary General of WWF, Professor Rajkumar from the Global uh, Jindal Law School, fellow environmentalists. See, my brother Justice uh, uh, remarked that he saw that the AQI, AQI index was 154. And that was very unhealthy. But probably 154 was one of the best days we've had this winter. <laughs> you see, we've been ranging from critical to extremely unhealthy. And coming to unhealthy is an improvement. That is the stage we've reached. We've stayed, reached a stage where Gurugram is now the most polluted city in the world. The NCR region is probably the most polluted region anywhere in the world. It's not something we need to be a bit proud of. And courts by themselves cannot do much. Let me be honest, I've been sitting on the green bench in Michael for three years, sitting with Justin Madan Lukur here for two years, we may pass orders, but finally day-to-day -day implementation is not in the hand. A lot has to be done by the administration, a lot has to be done by the public. Everybody has to work together. It cannot be left only to one set of persons to improve the environment. A lot of the ground has already been covered, so I will not repeat many things. But one or two things I must Emphasize once more is one that access to justice must be available to all. And when we talk of access to justice, we also mean access to environmental justice. As Brother Kandutu said, the worst affected are always the marginalized. And to expect them to come to Delhi for every problem of theirs is highly inequitable and not at all in line with the constitutional vision 
of providing equal justice to all. I quote a passage from the Rig Veda, the translation actually. My Sanskrit is very poor, I never did bad in school also. The sky is like a father, the earth like a mother, and the space as their son. The universe consisting of the three is like a family, and any kind of damage done to any one of the three throws the universe out of balance. I think we've gone a long, long way, way ahead in throwing the universe totally out of balance. This thought process a few thousand years ago clearly reflects the reverence which our ancestors had for the environment and the ecology. And this is not a thought unique to India. It is a thought which is a universal thought. Since the, my friends have come from Hawaii, from the United States, I'll quote from which is one of my favorites. Molika knows about it. It's Tripurava Venevichi. You know, that letter which is, which is some people doubt that the letter was ever written by the Indian American chief to the president. But whether it was written or not written, the thought expressed in that letter is wonderful. How can you buy or sell the sky? The warmth of the land. The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy that? Every part of this earth is sacred to my people. It's only if we realize that if we, this earth is sacred to us, not so much in a religious sort of term, but in environmental terms that you understand that this, we do not, we cannot exist without you. We must understand that we are a small strand in this cosmic web, which is called the universe. And if we imbalance the universe, it's an irreparable loss, which we may never be able to set right ever again. I myself had the, have had the privilege of working in three states. My home state of Himachal, then I was the Chief Justice in Tripura, and then in Chhattisgarh. All three states are endowed with natural beauty. And in all three, I find great environmental damage being done. In Himachal, we have power projects, we have coming all over the state. We have dams, rivers being dammed. Now that has been given up because they found that the Bhagra Dam is no longer useful enough. It was called one of the temples of modern India, but it's probably one of the disasters which has happened. The Hoover Dam on which it was designed has already been broken down. And now we have come to the stage of run of the river projects where the water from the river is taken into a tunnel, brought onto the other side of the mountain, down pipeline, generate electricity. And as head of the Green Bench, I had uh, commissioned an inquiry. And in, the in that inquiry, we found that out of 79 kilometers of the river Ravi, if all the projects projected by the government were actually constructed, the river would run openly only in about five to six kilometers, and the rest would be through tunnels only. Now that, what, that is going to have an impact on the environment which is unimaginable. You won't have any flora, fauna left in the river. So we thought of something, I mean, this something that had been done, so we passed an order that 15% of the water must be kept in the river. So. Somebody came up with a bright idea. You said, you think you're smart, there's somebody smarter than you. So they said, okay, 15% of the river water in February. Now in Himachal, all the rivers freeze in February, so you don't have any water in the river. So 15% of the water in February is almost like letting no water. In, in Tripura, I found by the time I reached there, that almost a large number of the Beautiful forest. Tripura had a forest cover of 70, 75 percent, if I'm not mistaken, one of the highest in the country. And the forest cover had been taken over the, by 
rubber plantations. On paper, it's still shown as forest cover, but rubber plantations are not forest. In Chhattisgarh, probably the biggest desert. The land which belongs to the tribals, the resources which belong to the tribals are taken away from them. They don't get a pittance and huge thermal power plants, steel mines, bauxite mines, the whole countryside is ravaged, pillaged. And what is the compensation? Now we do it all in the name of development. But development at what cost? Development for what purpose? Is development only for this generation? Or are we looking for development which is for generations to come? Which will have an impact which will we leave behind a legacy for our children or grandchildren? If we develop in this way, we are not going to leave behind anything for them to even utilize. The other aspect is, we, the so-called educated people, are the poorest environmentalists. The traditional people who live on the land are actually the true environmentalists. Having traveled and lived through in a large number of <coughs> tribal areas, they never take away more from the land than they need. And as has been often said, the earth provides enough to meet everyone's need, but not enough to meet even the greed of a few. And it is here that we have to balance. You see, there is also this population increasing in an exponential rate. Unless we control population, the needs you need more food, you, that, that means you need more fertilizers because, well, organic farming hasn't taken root as yet. And I don't know whether we, with organic farming we can even provide food to the large number of people. The population is increasing so much that something needs to be done. But when we have development, we have, and we need balance. But in the name of sustainable development, you cannot cause damage to the environment, which is irreversible. And my view is that when the development causes such damage to the environment, which cannot be repaired, then it is not sustainable. Development. You cannot have compensatory afforestment and payment of a few lakh of rupees or a few crore rupees and say, yes, we have balanced the damage to the environment. Because coming from the state of Himachal, if there are oak forests or deodar forests, it takes about a hundred years for those forests to mature. So you, you have to factor in that element of time also, which it will take for the forest to mature when you decide what is sustainable. Sustainable development cannot be termed to be only cannot be only taken in economic terms. It has to be measured both in environment terms and in economic terms. I am happy that Jindal Global University is starting this law course, this masters in environmental law. But for me, more than knowledge, much more than knowledge, what is more important is the sensitivity towards the environment. And I'm sure Professor Rajkumar will ensure that that sensitivity is also instilled in the students when, we, when this course is actually taught in the university. A sensitive approach to the environment has become very, very essential. We need to understand that we are not the owners of this earth. The bounty of our, uh, this nature is not ours to flitter away the way we feel like. We hold this earth in trust for future generations. 
we cannot use up all of the earth's resources for so-called development, for gains which are transient for the next 10, 20, 30 years and not and leave nothing behind for generations to come because then we violate a very established principle of intergenerational equity. I mean, uh, Justice Chandrachur has given a lot of facts, so I won't repeat most of it. But there was an increase of temperature over the last year. Uh, before we were talking about that, the biggest damage to the earth has been caused, as you are all aware, in the so called industrial age. But even in the industrial age, the rise in temperature in the first 100 years was only 0 0.8 degrees, less than 1 degree. And in the next 50 years, it is projected that if we are very lucky, if we work very hard, the rise will only be 1.1 degrees. But if we are not, we don't work hard enough, it will be 1.5 or 2. But the way things are going, I don't think we'll even be able to <coughs> cap it at 2 degrees, a rise of 2 degrees. And it's going to be nearer the doomsday prediction of 6.4 degrees over the course of the century. Now, a rise of 6.4 degrees is going to create havoc. Sea levels will rise, ice caps will melt, there will be intense precipitation in some part of the world, droughts in the other part, which is going to impact health, food, water, coastline, etc. This will impact human rights, the right to life. This is going to impact, if in, we look just at India, <coughs> Bangladesh, the Andaman Islands are going to be the most susceptible when there is a rise in temperatures. And with the rise in temperatures, if there is less area to be irrigated and cultivated in Bangladesh, there is going to be migration on it. One of the biggest effects of climate change is going to be migrations, large scale migrations. And these migrant refugees are not going to be accepted in the countries they want to go to, which is going to lead to greater conflicts. It is estimated that about 400,000 deaths already have already taken every year due to climate change. And this figure is likely to rise to 700,000 deaths per year by in another 10, 12 years. If there is a rise of only 2 degrees, the World Bank predicts that more than 100 to 400 million people shall be at risk of hunger. And maybe 3 million additional deaths from malnutrition each year. This is going to affect health, sanitation, the water. So what are we looking at? We are looking at a terrifying and you know, frightening situation. And if we don't tackle it, we are in for trouble. When we look, even in the neighboring countries, Bangladesh I have talk, talked about, if in the Tibetan plateau, our neighbors build a few dams, We'll follow them by building another some dams in our region over the Brahmaputra and Bangladesh will be go dry. Because nobody is going to bother about treaties and all when your very existence is in uh, is at stake. He was uh, just Chandra will come back to you. He was very scared with this 154. But uh, if we'd, back, if we'd been back at his alma mater this winter, he would have had to face temperatures of minus 39 in Boston. And that's a result of the polar vortex. This is also a result of climate change. We're having such severe weather. It's not global warming. That's a part of the climate change. It's what is happening all over is creating great, great damage.
The predictions and projections which we've talked about are indeed frightening and terrifying. And that needs strong remedial measures to be taken immediately. Otherwise, we're heading for a catastrophe. Let's not hide our heads in the sand like the proverbial apostate and think that nothing is going to happen. But I happen to be an optimist. For me, the glass is always half full. We have to take this up as a wake-up call, as a challenge. The time to actually work has already gone by. It was yesterday. But even today is not too late. If we start today, we still may be able to prevent some harm to the environment. Even if we start now, we may be able to preserve a major portion of the environment as we know it. Otherwise, forget our children or grandchildren or the future generations. We ourselves in the next couple of decades may see the earth vanishing as we see it today. And this is not for India or Indians alone. It is a universal problem. And therefore, it is for entire humankind to strive and stand together to protect what is our common ecological and environmental heritage. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Justice Gupta, for your inspiring words. I would now like to invite Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Wilson for a special address. Aloha. I always enjoy using that term in India because uh, I feel like namaste and aloha are the same and it makes me feel uh, at home and I do feel very much at home. My many uh, wonderful visits to India and today is a day I would say that we might celebrate as um, all of us being here at home. Thank you for your hospitality, Secretary General Singh. This has been a remarkable conference. It is uh, an extraordinary opportunity to be with Brother Gupta and Brother Shankarchu. And of course, my wonderful colleague, Sabrina McKenna, who we've been on such an adventure together. And then my brother in the avatar of justice, Raj, Raj Kumar. What about the sense of community? You know, there is a fearful future that seems to be virtually certain, that is described so eloquently by Justice Gupta and Justice Chandra Jude, so ominous and threatening that it has captured the attention of judges throughout the world, as Justice Chandra Jude has said, who now are the shepherds? We are now the stewards. We are now the decision makers at a level that is significant, there's no question about it, but the decisions that we've had the opportunity to make are a result of an extraordinary community that is developing around the world. But it's so prominent here in India. You know, it's, India is becoming famous because of the deterioration of its environment, there's no question about that, but if you spend time in India, with the judges, or you have an opportunity to be with the civil litigators, litigators who are working with courage and commitment and hope, despite the facts that we've heard, many of whom are in this room, that will not give up because they, as Justice Gupta has said, and has demonstrated, have hope. They have hope. Well, what is this reservoir of hope that we have that's now spread? It's an odd sort of hope that requires a sense of collaboration, unity, like humanity has never seen before. Who is stepping forward, really, to try to protect future generations? In large part, it is future generations. The, the leadership at this time is challenged has not been able to comply with the requirements of the treaty that most countries of the world entered into in April 2015. So the children, the young people are coming forward and there's this relationship in a way that's forming between the younger generation that are the true victims and the judiciary. 
But in between, you have this extraordinary community that is starting to include more and more of civil society represented by lawyers. But I would ask us to not lose sight of why this could be such a wonderful ultimate success on this most intense social issue that judges agree, professors agree, children agree, is the worst social issue we face. You could say it's greater than slavery, you could say it's greater than all the discrimination that humanity has faced, but what is this sort of silver lining other than the fact that we have a, theoretically a rule of law? It's the discrete nature of the solution. We're not talking about the difficulty of whether we should treat women equally. We are talking about the difficulty of who has the best religion. We are talking about the difficulty of whether people should be allowed to necessarily speak freely. We're simply talking about this theme of decarbonization. Decarbonization. Why? aren't we able to decarbonize? This is why it's so discreet, because where is the carbon coming from? It's coming from a small collection of powerful interests. Most of it comes from maybe 90 interests on Earth that are producing most of the carbon because they produce most of the energy, or producing most of the carbon because they are so involved in transportation, producing most of the carbon because of the way they engage in agriculture. This is the group that ultimately, I would submit, could well become part of our community because judges strive to get their attention in the sense of saying, there's a duty to not contaminate. You have it. no doubt about it, institutionalized positions that stand in favor of continuing the status quo. But little by little, I think the, the humanity that we all share that's being developed and expressed through the institution of the courts, but with the help of civil society, will include them. So let me conclude by how, in a sense, this extraordinary sense of justice is something that represents a, a breeze, a pure breeze, a breeze that is blowing in certain parts of the world, particularly in India. And it's a magnificent one that is based on principles that have to do with an independent judiciary that has stood up for the right to life, has developed a precautionary principle. These ideas that are in many ways meant to get the attention of the huge carbon producers. It is a breeze that is spreading, it's causing Greta Thunberg to stand up. It's giving more and more opportunity to those that want to protect nature. And finally, it is giving us the strength, I think, to understand how much this just means paying attention to your faith, paying attention to your family. Really, are we now at the point where when we consider the number of children that we've identified in a very straightforward, statistical way are dying because of diseases, can we just empathize with them at this point? I would love if we could have that kind of attachment. But it is possible because the degree of suffering is escalating so greatly that maybe eventually we'll be able to understand what it really means for climate refugees by the millions to move from Bangladesh by the year 2015 into India. Not because it's going to create a problem necessarily so much at the level of policy of an, a group that is taking resources, but because of their suffering and the suffering of our fellow citizens. So uh, I'm very grateful to have been here and to have been inspired by Brother Gupta and Brother Chandra Chu. I would uh, submit that for my um, 
great colleague and I have traveled around India now for five days straight, having given probably 20 different talks at the direction of uh, Professor Kumar, addressing students in law schools. The, the final stand is here. That's the way it's defined by many of the students at Jindal Law School. It's the final stand. We have maybe 20 or 30 years together, collectively, to come together as a community, but in starting to be led by spirits of unquenchable faith, as Gandhi described those that led the, the fight for freedom in India. This, these students are making the final stand with the idea that they are going to succeed and they're going to work against the odds. And their idea is to pass a law that could limit the amount of carbon that's allowed, allowed to be in, in the atmosphere here in India. But in any case, it's the kind of effort that I would submit shows that um, hope and um, a belief in the rule of law is alive and well in India, and it's a, a breeze that is spreading that I think will create uh, a future where we do become carbon neutral in time to be able to save the world community that includes not just uh, the humans we share the environment with, but the magnificent uh, animals that populate this earth and the magnificent environment that uh, makes it just an extraordinary place to live. Hawaii is the most ideal environment on earth, you might say, in the collective human consciousness. I would invite all of you to be there. We've had some very dramatic things recently with respect to climate change. Uh, you may have heard the term rain bomb. It's amazing. We had the strongest rain in recorded history. So when it came down, it created so much damage that it's taken us more than a year to be able to try to rehabilitate the area that was hit. So we're um, a small island and we um, benefit greatly from the leadership in uh, India, but also its great commitment to you know, the, the environment that includes a commitment to animals and plants like no other society. So, I'll say aloha again, thank you for all the inspiration and for the hope that you provide to judges internationally and to us in Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you, Justice Wilson. I now call upon Honorable Miss Justice Sabrina McKenna, judge from the Supreme Court of Hawaii, to give her a special address. I also say aloha. So, you know, I've always learned that when it's all been said, you don't need to say, repeat it, when it's already been said so eloquently by so many people. And thank you so much, Justice Chandra Chud and Justice Kupu, Jindal Global Law School and Jindal Global University for the creation and launch of this wonderful and important and Soul program in India, um, and an LLM, not in just in environmental law and for environmental science, but environmental justice, I'm sorry, um, environmental law, energy, and climate change. The only LLM also focusing on climate change. And as uh, Vice Chancellor Kumar has mentioned, we have a very strong, our Hawaii Supreme Court has a really strong connection with uh, Jindal Global Law School. And this will be the fifth year of us taking judicial law clerks. And, you know, I don't know if you're aware, but the um, mistress of ceremonies, Vebabi Duhid Betty, was one of our judicial clerks and last year, and she will now be returning to Hawaii later this year to get her, her LLM in environmental policy. And uh, one of our, the first batch in 2015, one of our judicial clerks, Agni Chudhari, there she is in the back there. Raise your hand over there. Okay, and she uh, was from our first uh, group of judicial clerks from uh, JGU, and she is working here at WWF India. So are we producing, helping produce environmentalists, right? 
JTU and um, Hawaii Supreme Court together. So, um, you know, thank you so much, Secretary General Ravi Singh. You said it so well. It's the Indo-Pacific. We have a strong connection uh, in so many ways. And in fact, you would be interested to know that in May of 2018, the former United States Armed Services Pacific Command was renamed the United States Armed Services Indo-Pacific Command in recognition of the connection of the Indo-Pacific area. Um, we take so much guidance from the India Supreme Court, um, and I, we have had similar decisions. We have a clean, right to a clean and healthful environment, and it is so important for judges to enforce environmental justice in so many ways. I'm not going to repeat uh, what I've said this morning, uh, but I just want to um, uh, mention that as uh, Professor Armin Rosenkrantz said, you know, in terms of enforcement of environmental justice, we must think globally, but the enforcement has to be local, at the national or the local level. And that is what we are also doing in Hawaii, uh, at the Hawaii Supreme Court. But as Justice Chandrachud and Justice Gupto have, have so well said, this is not an issue just for judges. It's an issue for all of us. We have to fight this together. You know, the sea level has risen 2.4 inches since 2000. Eight Pacific islands have already been submerged. Uh, the island of Carteret, I believe, in Papua New Guinea has had to be evacuated already. In the Marshall Islands, they're expecting 70,000 people in that country. The islands are going to disappear. Um, these will be climate refugees. So it is really up to all of us, the citizens, to do something about it. And I just, this is, I'm just, this is an aside. But I have checked into three hotels here in India. And each room has been set at 18. Eight, the air con is on at 18 degrees. And I walk in and I'm freezing. I really like to suggest that the young people make that an issue. Why in the world does it have to be set at 18 degrees? Uh, for example, the country of my birth, Japan, they now, the government has a policy that uh, government offices set at 27 degrees. And they encourage people to wear aloha shirts and light shirts. Uh, to work. It's called cool biz. That's what they call it. And you know, um, Justice Chandra Chub said it's 154, 2.5, the air quality index. So while he was saying that, I checked. And remember this, uh, I checked Hawaii, Honolulu, it's 21. And I checked Remember, Justice Wilson showed a slide this morning, and uh, it was India, all the children, you know, schools closing, and I think I, some of you weren't here. When I was a child in Tokyo, schools closed because the air was so dirty. Schools closed. I checked Shinjuku air quality, Tokyo, Tokyo air quality. It was 20, even better than Honolulu. And it wasn't the judges that cleaned the air in Japan. It was citizen groups. It was the people that rose up and said, we're angry and we're not going to take this anymore. We deserve clear, clean air. And it actually happened in Japan. So therefore, I would like to close with a thought. Environmental justice and the rule of law, it's the role of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Justice McKenna, for your thoughtful address. Thank India, WWF India, for his concluding remarks. Thank you very much.
in such an august gathering, I don't think I'll be giving concluding remarks, but I'll be giving a, I'll be proposing a word of thanks, a big word of thanks to all of you. But before that, let me tell you something. I was uh, there in Valmiki Tiger Reserve only yesterday, and it's a it's a small tiger reserve on the Indo-Nepal border, and I was walking with forest guards there, and forest guards maybe uh, they are. Uh, they might not be having the best of shoes, best of facilities uh, in that area, but they are the real soldiers of our environmental and ecological security. And uh, while they are protecting that area from poachers, from somebody who is targeting sand, mining, timber and all, but they are working very efficiently in that area because somewhere in their mind, back of mind, they have this confidence, they have this uh, support that uh, there are laws which are protecting them. Uh, there are uh, honorable judges who are supporting them and there are honorable courts which are protecting them. So a big thank you, thank you to all of you from their side, first of all. And for this evening, I would like to thank Honorable uh, Mr. Justice Deepak Gupta, Honorable Dr. Justice Chandrachu, Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Wilson, Honorable uh, Justice Sabrina, for taking time out for this uh, program. Uh, in spite of your busy schedule, we cannot understand. This shows, this uh, gives a reflection that what is the importance you pay to uh, environmental issues. So thank you very much and your presence here is, uh, your gracious presence here is very inspiring to each one of us sitting here. So thank you very much. I would also like to uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Raj Kumar, who is founding Vice Chancellor, OP General Global University and under whose guidance uh, the university has achieved many levels and I'm very sure that it is going to achieve many more in uh, future. I would also like to uh, propose a uh, special thanks and acknowledged contribution of uh, Professor Shridhar Patnayak, who is Director, Center of Postgraduate Legal Studies and Vice and Chief Proctor of uh, JGU, under whose leadership the joint LLM program, which is just launched, uh, has been, uh, I would say, uh, launched and created and then launched. On, uh, from WWF side, I would like to uh, sp give a special thanks to our own Secretary General and CEO, Mr. Ravi Singh, Sejal uh, Mura, she is not here I suppose, Program Director. Uh, and a special and big, big, big special thanks to Malika, uh, my colleague, who is advisor of CEO in WWF and her team. Uh, for because I, I have seen this, how meticulously they were planning all these things. They were designing every uh, bit of this program and execution today is like near perfect. Thank you very much, Monica, for all of this. And I have a long list, I think it's not extensive, but I have a long list of people to thank, which includes Anita uh, Sibhu, Lalit Mohan, Richa, Avni, Sandeep, Jay Prakash, our IT team, administrative staff, and special thanks to our gardeners who always make this venue so beautiful every time we are here for a program. So a big thank you to all of you. And finally, finally, I would like to uh, propose a sincere thanks to all of you, all of our invited guests who are here. My friends, uh, Ritwik, uh, his team, Rahul, Saurabh, uh, and other members of bar and bench, a, thank, a big thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. Badola. Lastly, I request Professor Vaisa Murthy, Registrar, OP Jindal Global University and Executive Director, Center for Human Rights Studies, Jindal Global Law School, to give his concluding remarks. Distinguished guests on the dais, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and dear students, a lot has been said since morning. I'll therefore keep my remarks brief. The climate change is a serious existential threat. And of course, there are several uh, triggers for displacement. Of the many triggers for displacement, the climate-induced refugees is a particularly serious one. Uh, if you look at the international normative framework, international legal framework, there are serious gaps as of now uh, for addressing this climate-induced displacement. So in this context, we are really delighted to launch this one-year LLM program on environmental law, energy, and climate change in collaboration with WWF and 
in particular, I wish to thank our partners, uh, particularly WWF Secretary General Mr. Ravi Singh, uh, Dr. Shajal Vora, and the advisor Maulika Ravi for partnering with us in this unique LLM program. I wish to thank uh, Justice <coughs> Chandrachud and Justice Deepak Gupta for gracing this occasion. Um, you can easily imagine the numerous demands on that time. In fact, uh, they were straight coming from an extraordinary full court hearing, and uh, they uh, um, and tomorrow is a full court sitting. And I wish to thank uh, uh, you both sincerely for uh, uh, taking off time, and to, that shows their extraordinary commitment to this uh, cause of uh, environmental protection. And. Uh, Mr. Chandrachud, in his fascinating lecture, has covered a wide gamut of issues. And uh, on the bench, he's leading a, um, a, a, a if you see the um, great judgments that have been I mean, issued by the Supreme Court in the last two years. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, it can be compared to a silent revolutionary. And the Supreme Court itself has been covering uh, uh, itself with a great glory with these path-breaking judgments. And uh, so we are really honored to have uh, um, really a distinguished judges, two from the Supreme Court of India and two from the US Supreme Court. And it's a unique event. And we wish to thank both uh, uh, this is Michael Wilson as well as Sabrina McKenna. And I also <laughs> want to thank uh, uh, the leadership of Professor C. Rajkumar, who envisaged this program. And also the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies, Dr. Sridhar Patnaik, and uh, and I also want to thank many of uh, uh, WWF uh, support staff who have helped in organizing this program. And I wish to acknowledge uh, the presence of many senior advocates of the Supreme Court of India, and also um, the Executive Council members of the Indian Society of International Law who are present here. And I wish to thank uh, our communication team, our events team. And uh, the master of ceremony is Vaibhavidvedi, and uh, all others uh, uh, who have, you know, worked uh, uh, for making this program a huge uh, success. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate Jindal Global Law School on the launch of your new Environmental Law, uh, Energy, and Climate Change LLM. What a wonderful program, and I look forward to uh, AJGU educating students further on these critical issues to human survival. Climate change is the most important issue facing humankind today. And I know that JGU students will continue to take ownership on this very important issue. We at the Hawaii Supreme Court have a really strong and lasting relationship with JGU. As you may know, every year we take four to five uh, judicial clerks every summer at the Hawaii Supreme Court. The students are excellent. We have continuing bonds with the students, and the students are going on to become the leaders that I knew they would be. So congratulations, JGU, and I look forward to a continued relationship. Thank you, and Yes, Doctor. It is with great pleasure that I speak to the young generation in India that would be considering being a lawyer. There is nothing more important in terms of an occupation at this point in history because of the real challenges the younger generations face through, in large part, climate change or the warming of the earth. And the most powerful tool that a person could possibly have to do good in society could well be a license to practice law. With a license to practice law, you are able to apply the rule of law in a way that in the past has been applied to make human rights a, a legitimate, an authentic part of a community. So rule of law is being applied to protect the environment. Rule of law is so powerful that it makes a difference in terms of protecting families and property and freedom. So, if you are at all thinking about being a lawyer, I would encourage you to consider, especially an institution like the Jindal Global Law School, because it is truly an opportunity to understand the rule of law at an international level. 
on issues that are affecting the world community more and more, having to do with public security, having to do with the environment, and really having to do with the future of technology such as artificial intelligence. And, and more importantly, you could say, what the future of civilization is going to look like. So I invite you to be a lawyer, and I wish you the luck in whatever career you decide to pursue.